mean, she really hasn't got the range, dear. Oh, welcome to Show People, the podcast that shines a spotlight on the UK performing arts industry, covering the latest news, industry issues, what to see and do, and showcasing theatrical talent whilst always trying to inform, educate, and entertain. Hello, company. My name is Andrew Keats. I'm a director and your host. Welcome to the show. Today's guest is just about to launch a sensational EP of his own songs. Uh, he's played Marius in Les Miserables at the Queen's Theatre, Fleet in Titanic at the Charing Cross. He's been one of the 12 tenors and even played Tony in the seminal BBC documentary about West Side Story. Please go mad, stamp your hands and clap your feet. Welcome Mr Rob Hodgson. Hello! Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, never a chore. Mm. Um, coming up on today's show, Rob and I will be getting on our soapbox discussing Twitter. Mm. Plus, tweet, tweet, tweet. tweet. Um, we have the latest dramatic news. And of course, throughout the show, I'll be interviewing Rob all about his life, his career, sending him some infamous show people challenges, and we'll even be playing a couple of tracks from his latest EP2. You're listening to the Show People podcast. Welcome to the show, Mr. Houchin. Hello, thank you for having me. It's Great to be here. My pleasure. Now, you were out late last night. <laughs> uh, no, I was out actually in my hometown of Lowestoft. Yeah, the most easterly point in Britain, for all you wandering out there. Um, fun fact of the day. Fun fact of the day. Um, and I was doing a hometown gig. So I was doing basically a preview of the launch of the EP. So uh, a lot of family and friends there. So it was really nice. A little 100-seat uh, theatre and got to sing with my sister and took down Craig Mathis. Some of you might know him, previous Marius. Yes. Marius before and after me. Marius Sandwich there. Uh, he uh, played guitar, played piano for me, very talented. So, uh, yeah, it was a great night. It was a great night, but I got driven back early hours of this morning, so... Bless you. That's all right. Bless you. And then at two o'clock in the morning, sending me tracks going, here's, <laughs> here's one, listen yeah. to this. Half-closed eye. Yeah. Is this the right one? Hopefully so. That kind of thing. So you said you were listening to yeah. Kim Ismay's yes. episode. Yes, yes. So you have a little idea of... What is about to come up in the format? I have a little idea, but I expect the unexpected from you, Andrew. I know that, I know. We've had some people who are a bit older than you, because actually, in reality... I'm 12. You're almost nine. Yeah, yeah exactly. How, just so that this is no, how old are you? 26. 26 years yeah. old. Yep. You have a wonderful uh, CV. Indeed, there are probably people in their mid-30s being like that. Bastards worked more than me. Do they smoke a lot, those people in the mid thirties? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> Elaine Stritch definitely listens. Um, but I found, I found going through your, uh, I thought rather than setting you, you know, the opportunity to remember your credits, right? Because that's quite attainable. Yeah, you know. Um, so instead, mm -hmm. being a Guildford School of Acting boy, mm -hmm. I was going through your special skills, Rob. <laughs> Oh. oh dear. So today's challenge, mm -hmm. you have 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, you've listed quite a lot of accents and dialects on your CV, Rob. Okay, yeah. So what I would like you to do over 60 seconds, mm -hmm. I will tell you what you have listed. Yeah. I would like you to give me a line from a song, mm -hmm. any song you wish. Oh, any in, song at all. Any song at all. It could be Hello Dolly to Hamilton. Wow. Okay. Um, Hello Hamilton. Actually, do you know what? That would be an amazing mashup of a show. Ben Hello Midler Dolly. As Alexander Hamilton. Totally. I can see it. I mean, to be honest with you, Bet Midler reading the phone book will sell out. <laughs> uh, and I imagine, I imagine Hamilton's not struggling to sell any tickets <laughs> yet. Ooh. Ooh. But, uh, okay, let's go through. I'm going to give you an accent or dialect. I want a lyric from a song. You mm. have 60 seconds to get mm. through them. Um, and there is probably my favourite specialist skill I have ever seen on an actor's CV ever. Are you kidding? What have I got? We'll get to the end of the challenge and I'll tell you. I can't even remember. It made me actually laugh out loud. Oh, dear. And I will remember this for, <laughs> oh. if I ever require somebody with this skill. Okay. Rob, <laughs> here is your show people challenge, which starts now. Okay, I would like to hear your best New York accent. 
I can't think of a song. I'm New feeling York, around York. the edge, living against the line. That's my own song there for you guys. It's very, very good. Um, I'd like your Southern State general accent. General Southern States. Um, uh, some people like. I'm just. Gonna, I'm just gonna leave it there for you. Your standard American, please. Standard American. What song should I sing? Uh, baby, you're a firework. Beautiful. That suits you more than a British accent. Does it? Yeah. Mm, maybe it's my blonde hair, blue eyes, Andrew. That, and, and German isn't on the CV. <laughs> um, Australian. Australian's my favourite. Uh, hit me, baby, one more time. <laughs> um, Southern Irish, please. Oh, this is my worst. <laughs> no way. The music's making me so nervous. <laughs> um, Southern Irish, what song shall I sing? Give me a song quick. We've only got six seconds. Um, empty chairs, empty tables, please. There's a grief that can't be spoken. That was a pain. That was almost Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, only missed a couple, which is a shame. Um, Sorry. You do a good Norfolk accent, apparently. Well, that's where I'm from, yeah. Are you a Norfolk boy? Well, I'm a Suffolk boy, but if you... If you uh, if you want to listen to a strong accent, you'd probably go to Norfolk. Where you're right, boy. How's it going, boy? Yeah, great. You going to Norwich? Yeah, I'm going to see you there. That kind of thing. Yeah. My my fiance is from Brundle. Ah, oh. I spend a lot of time in in Norwich. In fact, his his Norwich is nice. It's I lovely. Say that. I would say if anyone wants to go anywhere near where I'm from, I just head towards Norwich. Lowestoft is kind of the edge of the earth, kind of kind of place. Now, very flat, Norfolk. <laughs> very flat. <laughs> very flat. Um. So my favourite uh special skill that you have, Rob. Oh, gosh. Is face painting. You're oh, highly my skilled God, at I face painting. I knew it was going to be that. <laughs> Do you know what? I am face painter and proud. I am very highly skilled at face painting, Andrew. Right. Yeah, I used to, I used to do it as a summer job. And let me tell you, it's no easy skill. It's it can get quite technical. And how much would you charge for a typical face paint during those <laughs> those summer days? Well, to a fourteen year old slash up to the age of sixteen, I will admit, uh, as a summer job, one pound a face can get you a hefty thirty or forty pounds. Only a pound? Yes, because you know you've got to keep the prices low. It's all about quantity. You know, getting the customers in. They see that one pound sign and they think, wow, this is going to be a bargain. Quid to be a tiger. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, when you have to do a 70 year old man as a flower, you wish you'd have charged 10 pounds. That's all I'm saying. But then, I yeah. think, but then I think that's when you can negotiate. It's just going over the wrinkles, you know, contours. It's, it's all about that. But um, it's a Spider Man that I really banned. Yes. Yeah, that takes seven hours. So. So um, if you're looking uh, for, I nearly said if you want your face covered, <laughs> uh, which makes it sound revolting. If you are looking to have your face painted, um, sod the singing, sod the experience and the training. Um, contact Rob Houchen uh, <laughs> by emailing info at arian-productions.com. We will pass his details on. Now, I, uh, I'm, I will, of course, cover some of uh, your credits later on in the show. But the main reason of getting one here uh, is to talk about your upcoming EP. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about it. I've been I was listening okay. to you in the shower this morning and mm. going And that wasn't because I was in the shower with you. That was mm. no 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 no. It was that was because no. you were listening to a something playing my song. <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. Of course, exactly. Yes. I mean although it's but a large that, shower. <laughs> entirely possible. Terrible acoustics. Um tell me tell me tell me what's the what's the EP called and and tell me about your your journey to creating it um i did a previous ep uh called rh which was which was covers it was um four covers and one original track the last track and it was recorded live and it was called warning signs and a lot of people said you know this track's great like why why do you not write your own music and i said you know it's a challenge i've always wanted to take on and uh I admire anyone that can do it. So I, I gave it a go and I've written five tracks. One of them is Warning Signs uh, in a studio version, so a bit of a cheat. But um, the other four are brand new tracks and uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of music that I feel is in the soul pop genre and it's different parts of a relationship that you might be going into, you might be in or you might be coming out of. You know, it's kind of like different experiences that I've had and um, it's called Within Reach. And it's out October 29th. So we're going to have a, a good launch in Putney and uh, have some nice guests. I've got the amazing Bradley Jaden, who was in uh, Lamers with me as Andreas when I was Marius. And he's a really good friend of mine. He's now Fiero and Wicked. Uh, Tyrone Huntley, incredible voice I've always wanted to sing with. He's uh, currently in Dreamgirls where he's been in Regent's Park uh, version of... Jesus Christ, superstar. And he uh, was sensational. Yeah. Oh my God, that voice. I was just like, yeah, and everything. That show was incredible and he was just a highlight of it for me. 
and um, yeah, Christina Lardo, who I did West Side Story documentary with. So it's just all these people that I've just loved singing with or wanted to sing with. So um, I'm so excited. I, I, can't, I can't wait. Yeah, it's amazing. And the, the launch event, are there tickets mm. still available for people yeah. to get along? So how do you book tickets for it, Rob? You just go on the Half Moon website. It's uh, halfmoon.co.uk and you can follow the links there to the event on the 29th. And um, tickets are £15 online or £18 on the door if you decide to buy last minute uh, on the 29th of October. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bargain for all the talent that's going to be there. I've also got uh, an old friend, Craig Mather, on the drums. So, so No, on the drums. Sorry. Oh, damn on the guitar if he's on the drums he'll be panicking right now because uh he can't play the drums but um yeah just he's everything be, else yeah everything uh he can he can craig mather on the harpsichord yeah craig mather one man band yeah. um yeah so he's gonna be there as well it's just a, a good old family and friends group of all all people that i love to sing with i can't wait but what i really liked listening to it i mean it's in all genuine sincerity mm. um i love how soulful it is. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was just so lovely to hear something so soulful, particularly with the passing of someone like George Michael, for mm, example. And yeah. You don't, you know, you don't hear many young people trying to, to, to access that part of their yeah. side. Yeah. And I loved it. I completely agree. I completely agree. It's a, it's a big part of, of, of what I want to do as, as a music artist. I want to, bring soul into my singing because it it's inspired by the, the Stevie Wonders, the Luther Van Dross and George Michael and and it's I see that in people like Sam Smith, you know, it's it's really it's nice to see someone like him um in particular release some really beautiful, soulful music that um a younger audience and generation can listen to and tap into because yeah, like you say, there's a lot of uh electronic sounds out at the moment and a lot of pop that doesn't uh, you know, doesn't necessarily have that depth in vocal and might just be like catchy hooks and catchy tunes. But I think it's really nice when you can hear something and a song maybe that could literally just be piano and mm. and the vocal just take you somewhere, you know. And and um, that's what I'm all about is that kind of soul vocal, yeah. And you've written a lot of these tracks yourself. Mm. Yeah, so all of them were originally penned by me and um, I, I worked with a producer, you know, on the... Uh, accompaniments and things and like elaborating the production side of things but but yeah it's it's all been me and I can't actually uh, I admit I can't play the piano to a, a great degree so I, I sit there and I basically work out the chords myself and um and some melodies that I like and then someone helps me with elaborating that and and we go from there really yeah and I noticed as well uh, on your website that you're also offering a chord booklet if people yeah. want to purchase it, as yeah. well as very, very snazzy T-shirts. Everybody, <laughs> if you are looking for a great new pair of pyjamas, get on Rob's website. Yeah, yeah, Instagram pictures of you wearing that. I love it, I love it. Um, yeah, I've never done merchandise like that before, so it's really exciting. But um, we had a lot of requests last time, like from warning signs, can we get the chords for it? And, and I said, you know, obviously these things things uh, uh extra extra things that we've never done before and i'm new to it all so um i'm really excited to have that available to people like even last night people bought that from me like my own brother is learning guitar and he brought it and i was i thought that was cute i was i was like um i appreciate that a lot and it's it's nice to see people wanting to play your music there's nothing more flattering than that and and just just uh someone tapping into what you've been saying in the song and and relating to it and wanting to sing it themselves is is really 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 good to see i love it yeah such such a lovely thing well um as rob was saying we were discussing warning signs and here is that song which was on rob's original ep as a studio version uh, but was the only original track on his first ep rh which consisted of four covers and um, which reached the top 40 digital download chart on itunes it's absolutely extraordinary here it is Warning signs. There's a light in your eyes every time we kiss, see it close. Every time we kiss, makes me feel I'm home. My face in your hands as we stand out in the night Not sure, but I think that this feels right But I'm turning around in circles And I 
Amazing. Rob, you have such a wonderful voice and you are clearly such a talented, talented writer. Um, I will play another one of Rob's tracks later on in the show, so please do keep listening. Um, but until then, Rob and I are going to clamber onto our soapbox uh, and discuss what we feel about Twitter. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Mm. Now, both Rob, you and I are both quite infamous Twitterholics. Mm. Well, yes, I, I guess I waffle. That can be known. Within 140 characters. Yeah, yeah, 140 character waffle. (laughs) That sounds like a book. Um, Yeah, I I just, no, I I don't, I don't think I tweet uh, excessively. I just tweet things that might pop into my head and I might think people relate to or find funny. Do you, do you ever find yourself perhaps tweeting things that do pop in your head and then you go, no, 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 delete, delete, Mm. delete, must remember to, to be aware of of what I'm putting out there? Sometimes. I mean, it's not necessarily for me. Sometimes I know people can have things like, oh, that's too controversial. Whereas for me, it might be, that might be a bit too toilet humour directed. Like once I did say something about how long you spend on the toilet if you're on your phone, that might not have been classed as classy. So uh, (laughs) the other day I did think... You know, maybe I should tweet just letting everyone know how skilled I am at taking my socks off when I have a wee. But then I thought, no, that's probably not going to go down too well. So I just avoided it. And I felt actually quite impressed that I made that decision. Do you know what I mean? And I imagine <laughs> you obviously have a, a laminate floor uh, in your bathroom. <laughs> One no, that's the skill that, you know, not a drop was spilled. I mean, I don't know if I'm more appalled at the fact that you can do that or that you've got carpet in your bathroom. <laughs> or that I needed to. Or what, what a time-stricken life I lead. Uh, I'm quite... a. Uh, a person of great creature comfort so mm. nothing i enjoy more than like a, a, a duvet yeah uh, and it's that skill of being able to get your toe just behind mm. the back of the sock and take them off without using your hands well, that's see, a skill i've developed i spoke years. to a friend Celinda schoenmarker i'm sorry if i said your name wrong Celinda. um <laughs> if you're listening uh but she was saying to me how i she actually genuinely said it's not me blowing my own trumpet but she said that i tend to tweet things that come up in her head she just thinks it like the other day with the yellow sky thing happened and i said guys london's on night shift mode and she was like that's exactly what i was thinking like when i said if you bring a towel out of the airing cupboard it is just the nicest feeling ever you know the warm towel after you got out of the shower 
things like that, creature comforts, like you say. There is a sinister side to Twitter as well, where, I don't know, you, you get people like Katie Hopkins, for example, mm. who will, in my opinion, put out hate speech mm. and encourage vitriol on yeah. social media. And my, I've, I've just done a, a reading with Rufus Hound and we were discussing social media as he mm. encountered some trouble with uh, social media in the past. And he was saying to me, because whenever I see something from Katie Hopkins, my instinct is to either go, rah, 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 yeah. I hate you, I hate mm. you, why do you live? But that's what she wants, yeah. That is exactly mm. what she wants. And mm. that's what Rufus said to me. He said, you are just enabling her by fueling her yeah. with her hate. And it's, you know, these, mm. these companies like her newspaper columns and radio shows and TV shows and all these mm. things she does, they know that as a product, she kicks up a hornet's nest and then... I respond to it, then she gets a career. And it's like, why yeah. Why do I fall I for it? And it's hard to sometimes sit back and watch, watch that happen. Do you think that artists need Twitter in this day and age? I think, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, um, it does help a lot. And uh, I think that it is, it is something that does benefit you, but you don't need it. You don't need it if you've got the talent and the drive and the way to access avenues uh, in other forms, but it does help. I get a bit frustrated when casting directors will look at followers as to who they're going to cast in a show, who they're going to give the job to, because I think that really that should be beside the point. It's all about talent and who's right for the role. Um but I also think that in terms of the way I use Twitter, it's about reaching out to people and um, letting them know, you know, sometimes that you feel the same as they do and and showing the work you've done and sharing the theatre industry with people and so that they can see um, all the different aspects and sides of it and also see the humanity of people, you know, because... Um, like you say, there's a lot of people out there that tweet nasty stuff. And like I, sometimes I just want to tweet about hot towels from the airing cupboard <laughs> and just make people smile, you know? And and I think that's quite an uh, important part of it. And um, my friend, Eva Noblezada, who's now in Miss Saigon on Broadway, she tweets and Instagrams a lot of really personable, brilliant things uh, about, you know, protecting yourself and really inspiring for young women because she knows that they're all going to be watching her and her fans are in that kind of demographic and I think that's so impressive and I, I think that that is one way in which social media should be used like more and more and um, and yeah I'm, I'm all for that. I suppose it can also come down to taste because you mm. again often when I've sat down with uh, you know a few queens having a few drinks in some mm. file gay bar somewhere you always hear oh look there she goes delighted to announce another Ken Wright tour <laughs> and you think well Hang on a sec. I mean, look, being very, very British, we don't like <laughs> boasting very much, you know. Um, mm. But at the same time, whenever I see someone is delighted to announce they've got a job, I don't, yeah. I don't die inside like I know some no. people do. I'm sort of like brilliant. They've got a job. Yeah, marvelous. Yeah. Um, and because, it's funny because when something becomes um, repeatedly tweeted in that sense, like it becomes a joke. So, you know, when people do it now, like blessed or de delighted to announce, like yeah. you say, it's been done so often that it it's almost like you can hear someone sighing as they type it, like, oh, people will react this way. And that's that's what's kind of sad about it is because they just want to let you know and let friends know that they've got a job. And that's fantastic. And as you know, really hard nowadays. And, and it's clearly just, and it's clearly come you know, originated from some actor that has just copied something from an old-fashioned press release. Yeah. We are delighted to announce the yes. Lyceum will present. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. Um, and but th but then at the same time, I, I think I think the other thing we've got to remember: we we are artists, obviously. Yeah. And the only thing I do struggle a little bit about, um, and I'm always I'm always quite uncomfortable with this. Mm -hmm. I go to the theatre, what, three, four, five times a week. That's my, that's my job as an artistic director. But it's when somebody will go, oh, Andrew, make sure you tweet. And the difficulty I have is, yeah. what if I hated it? Yeah. Um, and secondly, I'm not a critic. I'm mm. not a reviewer, mm. even with this show. I'll recommend things that I think are going to be really great. Yeah. But I'm never going to go and see something and yeah. say, I give it four out of five stars. No. Not a reviewer don't want to be a reviewer, no. don't have the skills to be a reviewer or the interest. But it's that difficult thing of if I do see something and perhaps it's not to my liking, mm. 
I just won't tweet anything, mm. you know, or, um, and, and, and I always feel a bit dodgy about that because the people that know that I've come are clearly looking for are tweet. looking for a tweet and it's not mm. there. I understand, yeah. And that's that's another thing that comes with the uh, the actual, not importance, but the how substantial Twitter is in, in our industry now. It, it Like you say, people expect you to say things. And, and yeah, in the past, I, I will admit that I've found myself, you know, tweeting, oh, yeah, I went to see this, like, well done to everyone. And I'm like, oh, I hope I wrote that okay. Or I hope I didn't, mm. you know, I should I have thanked them or should I have said, like, oh, it was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. But, you know, I think it's just you just have to be honest with yourself and and think that if they expect something, then that's maybe, I think, a bit of a downfall on their part to expect a, a tweet about it. Like just, they should just be happy when they get good tweets and then get on with their job. Because as you know, that you can get bad reviews and good reviews in, in anything. And like lame has got really bad reviews and then it did pretty well. So yeah, I, I think if you end up finding yourself scrolling and looking for tweets, I think maybe that's the time when you need to put the phone down. <laughs> Do you, um, when you were doing Lame Ears and when you've been doing these these long running shows, did you ever find that Twitter could blur the boundaries between the footlights a little bit? And was that necessarily a good thing that you were so accessible? Did you find mm, yeah. people asking for your attention where perhaps, no, I'm not working, I'm at home with Mother Half watching yeah. the Bake Off, leaving yeah. alone? Like- <laughs> Definitely watching it. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. And I work with uh, Carrie Hope Fletcher, a good friend of mine, and I, I, I really... Um, appreciated the kind of insight I got into Twitter through her because she's so good at it and and so professional in the way that she deals with social media and um and when you know I got this interest from people that I didn't know was going to come in my life because I didn't know I was going to get this job uh, so early in my career um I was so uh I was kind of not sure how to deal with it and I, and like you say it was kind of like oh people see you in the street and then they tweet you that they've seen you and and you were kind of like just shopping or just you know walking to work or something and you're like okay I now need to kind of weirdly be on guard for my whole life do I is that what I need to do and 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 it's it's interesting and it's obviously a very like it's a microcosm compared to pop stars and massive stars and movie stars across the world but um it is an interesting uh kind of lesson to learn and an interesting experience because then you start to realize yeah how accessible you are well what do you think everybody well of course the best way to get in touch is social media so you can <laughs> tweet me <laughs> so tweet us you can tweet me using the handle at andrew keats or tweet the show using at show people uk and use the hashtag show people podcast you can send us an email to info at arian productions.com or via the show people facebook page at facebook.com forward slash show people podcast where you can also join the show's listeners forum um and i'm pretty sure this chap has one or two followers Hello, my dears, you have the ineffable and probably undeserved pleasure of listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. This is Stephen Fry wishing you a wonderful listen. Thank you. Lovely. So, uh, Rob, let's let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Thank you. You you cannot roll your eyes. Sorry, but I knew you were expecting it from me. I could just see it in your eyes. I think the hangover is just kicking in from last (laughs) night. I only had two gins. <laughs> what bottles? It's like water. That's just like it's literally like a glass of water. Dabbing it on behind the ears. Um, so, what was a young Rob Alchin like? Um, I actually never did any kind of drama or theatre. Well, I say behind closed doors, obviously, but not until I was sixteen. So, when I grew up, I was just creative and. Uh, yeah, all I was definitely dramatic. Don't get me wrong. Like I liked theatre, and um, but when it came to school, I I always loved to paint and draw. That's you know face painting. It doesn't come from nowhere, Andrew. No, I, uh, I that's what I love to do, and I was always creative. So um, I went to sixth form doing art and design and photography. Like I never did any drama, and it was just an after school club that we had to sign up to, and on the list was musical theatre. I mean, my friends did it, and we just had a laugh. And they made me sing Don't Stop Me Now by Queen and um, the rest is history. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, they, they put on a little show at the end of the term and my mum said, you can really sing, you should go to a local drama group. And I said, okay, yeah, um, how do I do that? So uh, she had a friend and her daughter took me in, and now we're still best friends. And, and it, was, it was great, but it was from 16 to 18, just very quick. 
That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it was just like, I, I love doing this. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a summer school. I went to summer school. Then I started auditions like literally months after. Guildford was just my top choice because uh, the pianist there, Peter Roberts, really, really wonderful man. Oh, love. Yeah, he, oh, <laughs> Peter. Uh, he um, <laughs> he, he um, played piano at the summer school I went to. So he just ah. said, come to Guildford, have a look around. And I loved it. And yeah, I was very, very lucky. And when you were growing up, so you said you, you grew up in, in Norfolk. Yeah, you know, Norfolk. well, near Norfolk, yeah, in Lower Stoft, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I do know the area. Yeah. It's, I, you have the the one large theatre that's there, but mm. I wouldn't say it's the place to go if you want to no. find all those shows. <laughs> no, um, beautiful, uh, wonderful pubs. Yeah, great shopping. Yeah, um, but when it comes to to discovering the theatre, you yeah. said you were only sixteen. I yeah, mean, when, when what was the first thing you saw? Um, I do remember when I was younger, I saw Fame at Norwich Theatre Royal. That oh. was. Um, that was that was pretty cool. I don't know whether it was the first show I saw, but luckily enough, my parents are quite... Well, my mum, she's always enjoyed the theatre. And uh, I think that that has actually... If I look back, I, I don't think about it enough, but I, I think that actually helped me a lot in into knowing what it was and being interested. Because if you, if you don't get taken, what do you see about theatre? You know, nowadays it's on the television a lot more, but back then it, it wasn't as much. So, um, and I remember I then got, I remember getting the video for Cats at one point. I watched that a lot. And um, and I also remember seeing Dr. Doolittle with Philip Schofield at the Theatre Royal. So these are like really early days productions that I saw. And I, and I, and I, all, I owe that all to my mum because she was the one that took me. But um, yeah, in terms of my own my own theatre experience, when I started in my amateur dramatic group, we just did like a movie review show. Was it called Decades, by any chance? <laughs> no, it was called Movie Magic. <laughs> movie Magic. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've seen shows by amateur dramatics companies? Or called Decades. Decades. <laughs> through the years of musical theatre, through the years of Broadway. Decades. And it consisted of me singing, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Oh. While a, a couple of people did a ballet as um, lines <laughs> <laughs> maybe i was the line no i wasn't no. I was, it was just, just clearly a cub in a black suit uh yeah so it was things like that we did review shows and um yeah i didn't have time to do many productions before i ended up going off to college to be honest because it was quite quick but i i definitely was like bitten by the bug and overtaken by the disease <laughs> do you know what i mean i was like oh my god what is this like i love to sing and, and back then i remember when i auditioned for my amdram i had to stand to the back wall because i was so so nervous about singing in front of anyone um they were like well, why don't you sing can you feel the love tonight it's okay so i learned it and i was like i'm really sorry can i just turn around because i don't want to mm. look into your eyes like you know and you're it's so funny to and remembering times like that in yourself that when you really really couldn't even bring yourself to sing a note like without shaking it's it helps when you teach it helps when you teach because um you see those kids that have so much potential and talent and you just want to bring it out so uh, i did a couple of workshops recently in japan and um at international schools there and uh in relation to Les Mis and they were just so so brilliant at like listening and opening up and like within a day it's just so amazing to see the journey that kids can go on so um yeah you i always look back at myself and think you know i'm not over overconfident now but compared to what i was yeah <laughs> how did um, it's interesting the, the the idea of the the artist the person that draws the person that yeah. observes conjures up quite an image of of somebody that is very much in in touch with their inner self yeah. and observing and being yeah. quite to go from that quite quite studious young lad yeah. drawing I don't know, Power Rangers or whatever you were drawing at the time, <laughs> to oh, think of my generation. Sorry, I forget. We're different ages. It's all right. Uh, but, you know, from, from being that being that, that sensitive drawer to being the kid that's singing Can You Feel the Love Tonight. Yeah. How did, how did was it your parents that helped? Were there any role models? Who was it that brought that confidence out in you? I had an aunt that would... Uh, she actually could play the piano and paint. So every two weeks, uh, Olive, her name was, she was Belgian, uh rest her soul she um she used to teach me every two weeks and uh, we would do an hour of piano and an hour of painting wow. so it was just a really nice creative input into my life and it was definitely from her side of things that inspired me that was when I was really young like I was like 10 and um so yeah it the whole musical aspect was there but I definitely I quit piano soon after which I wish I'd have carried on because I wish I could play better now but um the painting I've been doing ever since like that's something that I've done 
like I still do now. Like I, I love it because it's that kind of therapeutic way of just like you say, going into yourself and not, and you know, not having to worry or, or be judged. Like, you know, you can just create something and then, and then if, if you come back tomorrow and it's not what you want, you just go over it, you know? And it's, it's so nice. Like with each brushstroke, you like, you learn new things and it's very related to singing in a way, but but like you say, yeah, it's a bit of a leap from that to performing on stage. But I guess I was kind of painting and creating and putting my uh, my kind of like views in into the paper and then showing them. Whereas with singing, it was kind of direct. Do you know what mm. I mean? There and then giving myself to, uh, to the audience or whatever. So it kind of was just that step that that needed to be taken. And um, yeah, it was definitely influenced by my aunt. She was she was a big influence. So we are both uh, GSA uh, alumni. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that application for drama school. What, mm. were you, what did you do to prepare for, for GSA? Well, I was saying I actually was very into art still. So I was still doing my A-levels in graphic design and photography and fine art. And I also applied for drama school at the same time. So I put both the applications out and got into both so I was like okay what do I do now like because you know even though my heart was clearly in musical theatre I still thought you know I've been doing art for my whole life and uh obviously really there was no decision to be made but in the end um I decided to go to drama school but it was definitely me suddenly thinking oh my god this is going to be day in day out my life Mm -hmm. so I needed to like I'd never danced before Like that was a new thing for me. So I was like making sure that I had all the equipment for that and and just kind of preparing myself mentally for everything and and making sure that I I knew it's not like a uni degree where you do a couple of hours lectures a day. It's nine to five or, you know, eight to six. Like it's long days of hard work. So you've got to go knowing that that's what you want to do, I think. You know, some people like my friends changed their mind within a term or whatever. And and some people, you know, decided when they were doing it, they didn't like it. And that's that's, you know, each to their own. But I think if you're going to commit to something, especially when it costs a lot of money as well, like if you're going to commit to something like that, I would say, like, think, yeah, this is for me because because it's hard work. Tell me how um, tell me how you're able to fund that training. It's one of mm. the questions I always like to ask. I know there are so many people listening to this mm. who are considering training and they're seeing the bills that are yeah. ahead of them. And mm. of course, it's not just the tuition fees, it's the accommodation, it's Oof, the yeah. cost of those dance belts, which yeah. I do not miss. I remember the book list at mm. Guildford, which oh, used to be like going yeah, to Hogwarts. That. Yeah. How, How many, many people? Did you read? Yeah, mm. Well, I did read a lot, but that was because I was lonely. But um, <laughs> no, I didn't read that many books uh, on the list, but only because I'm a bit of a slow reader. Well, if I really get into a book like Harry Potter, then I'll read, <laughs> then I'll read it in an hour. But but um, yeah, I definitely read Secret History. That was a good book. But apart from that, uh, no, not that many. But you know, you you do what you can, and then you take what you can from it. You, like I say, each to their own. I got great parts when I was at school, so I was so lucky. Like the shows just worked for me, and and um, meant that I really fitted into the roles. So I was so pleased. But some people didn't, and you know that can really affect your your like degree. It can it can affect your journey, and yeah, you just have to take from it what you can, I guess. What were your um? Can you remember what your audition songs were for GSA? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Go I on. had a I had a horrible story. So basically, um, my audition. You have to not take any Claude, Claude Michel or uh, anything like that, really. And so when we had to get up on the... This isn't my audition song, actually. My audition song was pre-1960s, and I, I took... <laughs> from Brigadoon, I took Come To Me, Bend To Me. Wow. <laughs> Which is really nice. That's a, really a lovely nice choice. Song. But now and then when you say the title, it makes you giggle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I took that and I took Why God Why, you know, because I really didn't know much about musical theatre. I thought you couldn't take any Schoenberg. Well, mm. so when they asked us <laughs> on the first day... Um, you know, we're going to all sing together. We're going to get you all in a room. You know, the most daunting thing in the world. Everyone's going to get up and sing. And... um one by one so I got up and I was like yeah I've got um I've got why God why I'll bring him home and um you must have been hated the teacher was like we told you no Claude Michel and I was like ah oh, um okay and he was like we'll have bring him home and I was like okay you know right then thinking no not thinking at all that I'm obviously not a Jean Valjean <laughs> 
So I, um, maybe school's production. So I, I gave it to him and he, and he started to play it. And then there was a page missing. So we had to do Why God Why. So really it was all a bit of a, a misfortune, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. But then again, my audition for Les Mis, I did have to stop the pianist about four times because I kept forgetting the words because I was so nervous. So, you know, things can turn out good from bad. And that's, that's kind of a good lesson to learn, I think. And 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 how did you how did you you fund that training? Did I you... still have a student loan, yes. So uh, that's floating around somewhere in the ether. But I um I I managed to get a hefty, so that was good. That that was kind of like a little bit of funding. Um, obviously it wasn't a da da so da da as I call it. <laughs> so it didn't uh, get fully funded. Uh, I managed to get a grant from a local authority, and they helped me a lot and also I managed to get a grant while I was there um, because I got good A-levels which was really cool I didn't know that even existed um, if you get I think two or three A's or something above that so you know academics does help guys yeah <laughs> but um so that that kind of helped but yeah the student loan is still hanging up high so it, it does cost a lot of money so like I say you really need to think about that as an aspect which is such a shame because you know a lot of people will think oh I can't go because I can't afford it but um if you can look around and literally contact anyone that you can think of, anyone, I put it in the paper and everything. And, and that local authority got to me and I was like, thank you so much. And, um, it helped so much. So, uh, yeah, that there, there, there might be someone out there. And what were some of the things that you learned at Guildford that really stay with you? What, 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 what comes into your mind that, that you appreciate and has helped you as an artist? Um, when we begin at drama school, when we begun, when we begin, when we all begin together, it sounds like we're about to do it. Um, you you tend to get uh, stripped back. They kind of want to want to take away what is you. I think what is effective to remember is that when they're taking that away, don't forget what it was. Do you know what I mean? Because I think the point of it is it's like I don't know taking it off you and then giving it back to you after a while because a lot of people you know they lost their accents and I think it's really important to keep aspects of you that make you you and um so if you do get stripped back and you do like get made to you know speak properly and everything you know remember the traits that that give you um individuality and because that's something that I always thought you know at the end of it I don't want to just become one in a crowd you you want to you want to be original and do things that are that are natural to you and your instincts and the things that make because that's when you go into an audition room and people think ah oh, you stand out because you're very natural and instinctive and like I spoke about Carrie earlier she didn't train at all and um she comes from a very musical family fair enough but but I remember seeing her in the audition and I thought your instincts are so natural and, and wonderful and and that is just from her you know so it's important I think weirdly it sounds like what I learned was not anything from the school but it, it it was it was it was to use the skills that they're teaching you but channel them through yourself and and make sure you keep your own traits i can i can remember from my own time there and certainly with a lot of the young people that i i work with now and have done historically how how vulnerable people are at that age mm, as well you know yeah. when people are arriving they've literally just turned 18 and yeah. the first thing they're told is we're going to strip you back yeah. can actually have some really long-term damage on people yeah. and i don't know that I, that that style of training i don't know actually how helpful mm. it is um I'm, you know, yes, there are the bills to go to drama school, but I think the bigger bills are the therapy for all the people <laughs> that afterwards who don't work and wonder why they're such a yeah. quivering wreck. Yeah. They go, oh, you went to drama school. Right. Uh, ah, we'll be with each other a for a good five years <laughs> yeah. every week. Sign this and pounds. this. Yeah. But, um, but, but, you know, drama schools aren't perfect places. What were some of your experiences yeah. that perhaps weren't helpful that now as an, as an established performer, you kind of go, this didn't work for me? Um, I think as when I was there... It, to be honest, those experiences, um, negative, we could call them, were, were based f and came from me because I would be doing dance classes, which I knew wasn't my strength, and I would really find the frustration in that. So when we, we would learn and, and I would learn routines, I would find that so frustrating and it would create a mental block in my head. But I think rather than being told you need to be able to dance, like you need to be great at this, I think it, it's good to be told that um, you work to your strengths. And if you, you know, like a lot of the times I would have to stop because I couldn't, you know, do the move. I couldn't, couldn't remember it. And then I would beat myself up. I think that was such a mistake because it would just mm. dig me lower and lower and lower. The, the point of it is to stop, you know, collect yourself and tell yourself, what are you good at? Like, yeah, you're not the best one in the room at this, but you're also you. And 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 I I shouldn't have you know 
like beat myself up about it. I should have just enhanced my uh, belief in myself, I think, from it. I, I don't think that you should be pressured into being a triple threat, as they call you, because there's going to be work out there for all different types of people forever. It's not going to be about, oh, my God, you can't dance. We're never going to work with you. Do you know what I mean? But then I suppose you transfer that that particularly when theatre or musical theatre becomes that thing that we yeah. love. You know, it's why I hate I hate the term stagey because I'm like, it's just passion and love. Yeah, we all, yeah. We're allowed to be passionate yeah. and love what we do and be proud of it. But you transfer all of those emotions from being a kid to an institution. Yeah. And it's all very well saying, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have worried about, you know, that dance. Yeah. Well, actually, you have got a tutor that says, unless you get a C in this discipline, in this that discipline, is true, yeah. you can't do this anymore. You yeah. can't come to this institution yeah. anymore. Mm. And then you end up in this sort of alerted state going, I must be good at everything. Yeah. And then I don't think you do get a refined artist. I think you get somebody... Well, it doesn't progress you. No. You, it's hard to progress when you're in that mental state. And it's funny because nowadays like you say you can look back and see that in yourself but also like you say you are vulnerable and you are wanting to impress you are when something is your whole life it's i call it the bubble like i was in the gsa bubble and like like when i was in lame is i was in the lame is bubble and, and it's like you, everything is different everything means different things depending on what is your core what is the core of that bubble and when when it is you know like when it comes to agents and when it comes to final shows and the, the tension is so high and a lot of my friends didn't get agents and then they still went on to do fantastic things. Uh, a good friend of mine only have recently has had an agent and he's worked for years and years off his own back, you know, contacting people himself and he's done amazing jobs and it really isn't the be all and end all. And I think the pressure, which obviously needs to be put on in some respects in terms of, you know, be the best you can be, but also there's not, a sense of realism there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Of what can happen. Well, uh, we could get on our soapbox probably talking about <laughs> drama schools immediately after. Uh, How many soapboxes do you have? As many as you want. As many as you want. Rob is going to be with us uh, for the rest of the show, of course. But now we descend into dramatic news. That's right, in today's <laughs> dramatic news, uh, the Show People podcast was nominated for Favourite Radio Show or Podcast in the Theatre Community Awards. Uh, we didn't win, sadly. The award went to our friends at the Sunday Show Tunes. However, we are deeply honoured to be nominated after only five episodes. Thank you for the recognition. Vicky Featherstone has announced a day of events programmed in response to Harvey Weinstein revelations. The artistic director of the Royal Court has responded to people who have spoken out about abuses of power in the theatre industry. Following the news coverage of Weinstein, Featherstone tweeted last week to ask what should be done. In response, she has set up an industry-wide town hall session where the verbal code of conduct already practised by the Royal Court can be communicated to the wider community. There will also be an opportunity to learn from other organisations and a sharing space set up led by Royal Court Associate Director Lucy. C. Morrison. The event will take place on Saturday, 28th of October, between 12 and 5 pm, and is free with no booking required. The Young Vic has announced that executive director Lucy Woollett will step down in December after a decade at the venue. Woollett joined the theatre as finance director in 2008, moving to her current position two years later. Alongside artistic director David Lan, she's overseen a transformation of the venue, which has seen the company's income double and multiple productions transfer to the West End and Broadway. During her employment at the Young Vic, uh, the Young Vic has won six Olivier Awards, four Critics Circle Awards, four Evening Standard Awards, and the Stage Theatre of the Year Awards in 2015. On her time in the role, Woollett said, I'm incredibly proud of what we have achieved night after night at the Young Vic on tour and in the West End. And our final story, The Rink will be coming back to London. That's right, at Southwark Playhouse next year. Uh, the first production is to be staged uh, by Adam Lenson. The Rink follows Italian housewife Anna, who runs a roller skating rink. She's about to sell it when her estranged daughter returns and is determined to save it. Uh, the Rink runs from the 29th of May to the 29th of June with previews from the 25th of May. Are you involved in a show that you'd like to tell our listeners about? Please let me know. Just email info at arian-productions.com and we'll do our best to share with our listeners. So, Rob, you, you leave the Guildford School of Acting. Mm -hmm. What happened next? Um, when I left Guildford, I realised that in the big wide world, jobs don't just come knocking at your door straight away. So I needed to earn a living. So I heard, <laughs> as a vulnerable graduate does, that um, there was a recruitment company 
that uh, hired you to work at Harrods and other stores. It's very common. I think a lot of uh, graduates ended up working there. So I went through the process and ended up doing some shifts at Harrods and John Lewis um, on the shop floor, selling things like Ormond Jane perfume and, you know, trying to get people to buy and get commission. Um, And yeah, it was interesting to think, ah, so that bubble that I'm now out of um, doesn't exist anymore. And my core of, I didn't really have a core. It was like, I'm in the big wide world on my own. And um, that's something that you really need to prepare for. And I think drama schools should prepare you for because um, I think that's one thing that I didn't really have enough of was um, preparation into living on your own, living, you know, the taxes will follow, not yet, but things like that, you know, and getting jobs and working and and just being being a normal self-employed person because suddenly I was and I didn't have that student loan well. I did still have it there somewhere, but I wasn't allowed to use it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's it, it was it was difficult, but it was also a, like an experience and a good learning curve. And then I managed to get a job working with the Twelve Tenors, which toured Germany. So I went with them, um, and we went all around different parts of Germany on a bus, and and that was incredible. And uh, it was really hard work, hard on my voice. I was singing opera, singing rock, pop, like everything and um incredible harmonies and we would do a show one night and maybe get a coach to another venue the next night and it was just like very hard work and I was living out of a suitcase and it was a good first job to have it really was good grounding for me but when I was in um I think I was in Frankfurt or somewhere like that I got an audition for Les Mis and then I had to fly back Ryanair was very helpful they haven't been recently but they were very helpful (laughs) back then uh with some good 20 pound flights from the middle of nowhere in Germany uh to London so I could audition a good four or five times for Les Mis um I was young and unafraid I was gonna say I was young (laughs) and naive I didn't I didn't really know uh much even about the show I to be honest I thought Empty Chairs was the one you'd skip on the soundtrack I was like you know I and actually, sometimes I think naivety when it comes to things can give you a, a refreshing look. Like as an auditionee, people don't necessarily want to see someone who's got that pressure on their shoulders, you know, who's like, oh, my God, this is everything. You know, it, it's good to go in there with an open mind. And and um, and it was a good experience. I mean, I just remember thinking I was on the bus one day between venues and like I'm waiting for the call, which is the worst thing ever is when you're waiting for the call. And then I was in H&M and I got the call and they said, <laughs> and, and I was like, one second, I'm just paying. No, I wasn't. I was like, um, I was like, great, amazing. And I remember thinking my friend was with me and uh, he did the 12 tenors with me. And he he was like more overwhelmed than I was because somehow you've been going through so much that you're like, it was either going to be or it wasn't. I don't know. You're kind of in this. I was in this weird place where I was like wow it's gonna happen and it hadn't sunk in yet so I got a couple of weeks after I finished uh, the 12 tenors and then I got to start Les Mis. Taking you back mm-hmm. to uh, Harrods or Horrids as mm. I've uh, heard it called how did, I, did, I mean did you just see that as a means to an end or did you find that quite <laughs> a means to an end you know did, was it <laughs> was it quite soul destroying because you know I see uh, as somebody who of course has been to Harrods I see the way that people just walk past the vendors there without making eye contact. Was that tough on you psychologically and for your soul or um, are you made of sterner stuff and I'm just being... <laughs> Maybe you're just being very sensitive, being very sensitive. Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, sensitive. Uh, time of the year. Creative. <laughs> um, for me, actually, it was okay. Um, I I didn't... F- the one thing I found most difficult about it was this, the strict ways that you had to behave um i just like what well you're not allowed to talk to anyone ever you're in your own little um counter so i mean you can speak to anyone on that counter with you but they have these people that come around and if they wear like (laughs) sorry if anyone's listening who works at harrods but if they wear like a red rose like which is very hunger games isn't it they they would um they'd be the like the managers and you wouldn't if you got caught talking then they'd be like they'd give you a warning so it was very like yeah it was very intense and it's also hard like obviously as an actor you know you can be seen as oh well how can you not be comfortable trying to impress people but it's it's not like that with acting whereas when you're working in a in a store you know you really you're really like wanting them to come and buy your product and I've sold my own product before 
And with Bradley Jaden, we we sold peanut butter. People may know out there, but um, and that's really nice because it's your product that you're proud of. But when you're selling someone else's product that really doesn't mean much to you, it is a little bit. Yeah, it does. It does um, drain it from you a little bit. It just drain you. And so you obviously get the the role of Marius in mm. Les Misérables. You said that when you got to the Guildford School of Acting, mm. you uh, had Bring Him Home firmly tucked, <laughs> I know. Uh, tucked under your arm. I know. Was Les Mis, was that the show that really made you fall in love with musical theatre? Um, quite interestingly, I didn't, I wasn't as uh, into it as a lot of people in my year in it and people in the school around me. I, I, I just knew it from it being so famous. Whereas I knew a lot of boys when it came to like, in third year we had auditions for it and um i didn't get one because I, w- I looked too young and um, so everyone else was getting auditions for it when they would come into the school and i was like oh like this is interesting this is exciting isn't it but i wasn't really that bothered and everyone was like oh my god this is my life like, i need to get it <laughs> and um like this like, is just like, literally like stars like in the corridor you'd hear every five minutes and um and so I was like, okay. And then it was the year after that they saw me and I was like, wow, I really think I still look 12. So I don't know why now it's worked. But the film was kind of on my side because uh, Eddie Redmayne looks quite young and they were, I didn't realise, but they were going quite young in the London cast. And um, yeah, all my stars kind of aligned in that sense. But I do remember seeing Les Mis when I was uh, 17, 18 and I sat in row B and it was because we got some really good tickets. And, um, and I remember them like, they would come up singing at the end of the day and... And I always tell the story how someone spat on my face and I was like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is really great. Yeah, I like this. This is good. This is interactive. This is like getting me involved. And and then when I was doing the show, I was like, I'm that spitter. Yeah. I'm that person. I'm, I'm, uh, and it was really nice to have that kind of like switcheroo, you know, where I was like in row B and now I'm on the stage and, and, What's really great about Marius is you get to be that ensemble character at the start. So you get to experience, you know, having all these different costumes and all these different roles and, and just changing it around and having fun. And and I loved that. And it was um, I think that's one of the greatest things about doing the role. Uh, yeah, so it did kind of have a special place in my heart, but it didn't like it wasn't like, oh, my God, I need to get this job. It, so I think, like I say before, it made it quite nice and refreshing in the sense that I was like a little bit unknowing to it. And that meant that when I learned more about the show, I was just I was really learning about it. Like I was just like, oh, my God, like I didn't realize how amazing this score is, how amazing the story is, all the different colors to it. And it ended up the empty chairs you know, it was a much more amazing song than I ever gave a credit for. Mm. And um, and yeah, it was just fantastic. And once we had Claude Michelle come in and and um, to go through the music with us and just give us some notes and stories and things like that are just invaluable. Like, I have to ask you because yeah. all of our listeners will be thinking, what did he say? <laughs> what were what were some of the? I mean, obviously, empty chairs at empty tables is yeah. such a denouement in the in in the show. Yeah. What did he What did he say? What did the director um, say to you about that moment that you found empowering of that particular moment? In, in yeah, Memphis? it's hard because you're in the show. I mean, I'm not going to ruin it for anyone, but like the the revolve turns and and you're kind of you need to be in that mindset. So like, the more you do a show, it comes it comes into a place where it's like um, emotional muscle memory. It's interesting. It's like I found it easier to find myself in that mindset and in that place. But and you know, you never. I hope that you'd never have experienced, you know, the amount of the amount of loss that that he had had. But you need to kind of find any influences that you can in your life to to find that connection. And I remember, you know, when I was auditioning for it right at the beginning, um, the director Chris Key was was clicking next to. I speak to him about it, and I I laugh about it. But he was clicking next to my head, and he was saying, "Next level, next level, next level." Like really find, you know, go deeper, find the next level. And I remember afterwards, I was like. I don't know. I, I I felt like, as well as having a bit of a sore throat because I was really going for it. Um, I was I was like, wow, that you really can go further than you think. And um, and I, if if a song is sad, it doesn't mean you have to like whisper it. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, it it really is finding dynamics in it. And when Claude came in, he didn't necessarily speak in about that song in particular, but he was giving us a lot a lot of um, background from the songs and, and the way he'd written them and the way that things like um, look down was was old uh, original chants from workers that he put into it and and it's finding like reality in it it's finding realness because 
because obviously like this it can be a beautiful fairy tale story you know where where so and so gets the girl and whatever but unless you find in a reality in it then i don't think people are going to you know connect they're not they're not going to find themselves in your shoes so that was that was what i was looking at a lot how um, how long were you in the show for <laughs> i was in the show for 2 years and 8 months i think me and how? carrie started together so we said we kind of weirdly managed to work it so that we finished together because then they could get a new Eponina Marius in and, and it was so nice. They, they gave us a little speech at the end and yeah, I honestly wouldn't have had it any other way. It was great. Now there will be some people out there who go, if I got into Les Mis, I'd be there forever. As indeed <laughs> there, there are some people who have been. Uh, tell me, how do you maintain that focus, that concentration mm. over such a long amount of time without just going numb to everything what what can you do yeah it's kind of it's interesting you get that question a lot and you get that question of you know did you just go in and it end up being a job and I just feel like if it starts becoming that then you need to look at ways to reinvent the role for yourself ways to reinvent the places you go to to get to certain levels certain emotions and I would just think you know you don't it's day days are going to be different things in your life are going to happen and and that's what you need to apply to it and so for me it would always be fresh not only because your actors would change because people were on holiday people were ill and and you'd have different people to work with that did different things and obviously you'd react in different ways and and um have different connections in certain ways and and um it would lead you down different paths and and i think it's always good to just keep an open mind and like an open heart when you're performing and to make sure that you know you're not restricting to a certain way that you do this show because that is when it will become monotonous mm -hmm. and and that is when it will become boring for you and it will just suck the fun out of it you've got to keep having fun and playing because for me that's what i kept doing and therefore it made it feel fresh and luckily I never had that problem and were you sad to see the end of Les Mis did you do you have any regrets no um I'm so glad that it, I left when I did because I wasn't clawing at the walls to leave you know like you say like some people they might find that oh god creatively I've reached a point where I I don't want to do this job anymore which is really sad and I hadn't I still really enjoyed it and it's funny because you think when you know that you're going to leave on a certain date like people will say you know this is my last year or whatever whatever you're like oh god I've got a few months left you know I've got plenty of time like and then suddenly it's one week to go and mm -hmm. and you're just like I haven't got anyone a card. <laughs> do you know I mean? Oh God. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I need to do a book full of photos, which is very me. Just like, oh God, I need to do everything. I need to make seven cakes. Yeah. So, um, so I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is a big point in my life about to end. But you've just got to embrace it and make sure that that doesn't, I, there was a, a point when I had a slight danger that um, it was going to make me put too much pressure on myself, which is, uh, as a running theme of this podcast, something that I have done before. And, um, which meant that, you know, my voice wasn't as good as I wanted it to be and I was not hitting notes in the same way. But I was like, towards the end, I thought, do you know what? Let's just live it and, and just love it. And I was like, I'm not going to I'm not gonna worry about that. And mm -hmm. I, the adrenaline gets you through anyway. And, you know, let's face it, your voice is never going to be amazing when you're crying in every scene, even though if it's a happy one. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you just, I, I had a really amazing last show. My mum and my sister in the front row, which, you know, I did say... It could be off-putting, but it was okay because, like I say, I was in such an adrenaline place anyway. It was um, it was really nice. And, and I remember after Little Fall of Rain, when Gronta comes over and he gives you a hug, I was like, oh! <laughs> yeah, I was, it was real. It was like real. It was gut tears. It was a lot. It was a lot. But, um, but I was, yeah, sad in a happy way. It was just like looking forward to new things. And, and people say, like, would you go back and do it again? Um, and it's nothing against the role or the show, but I just feel like I had such a nice time. I would like to leave it in that picture frame. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't, I'd love to just leave it there. Maybe come back as another role in the future when I'm a bit older, but I had such a good time that I'd like to just look back at it as that. So we're going to go back to your album. Mm -hmm. So I am, um, the reason I chose to play this song second mm. is when I had a, a, a listen to it, I mm. found a touch of sadness to the song was mm. how, how I heard it. I wondered that the song is obviously safe and sound, mm. which is beautiful. Oh, and I thought, well, 
Let's not open the show with a downer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Might be slightly yeah. harder. But perhaps you might like to say... That's why Empty Chairs isn't the opening number. Can you really? imagine? <laughs> but no, honestly, I, I found it very, very touching. I was very moved when I listened to it. And the there is an ambiguity to the lyrics, yeah. which is a sign of a great songwriter, but also it's clearly not something that you've just done... Uh, that you've just thrown together and gone, that's a song. It's clearly yeah, personal. Yeah. Perhaps you might like to give a little bit of context about the song before we play it. Yeah, um, like I say, a lot of my songs, as as I'm sure a lot of artists uh, have the same theme, it is relationship-based. You know, it, it's from experiences that you've had in relationships and, and how you look at yourself after them. Like, um, like when you're in a relationship, you can sometimes find yourself changing to, to be with that person or to impress them and then you think this is not the person that I want myself to be and I think this song is kind of like that like it's not like an F you song do you know what I mean it's like a it's it's it sounds like that in the lyrics sometimes but it's more like do you know what actually I don't need to alter the way that I am and and chase you I can actually just be myself and let go of you and find something better for me and and go back to the way that I wanted myself to be. Because if you're not happy with yourself, then you're not going to be happy in the relationship at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, <laughs> can't help but smile every time I say that line. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's kind of about that. It's about really thinking, do you know what? This this person isn't the one. It is it isn't it isn't gonna happen. And that it's not the end of the world. Do you know what I mean? It's it's about yourself. That is what's more important. Looking looking into your eyes as you as you tell that story, mm. there is clearly some figure that is that is part of your, <laughs> your <laughs> past. <laughs> I wonder is that part of the reason of creating this album to address those those emotions or Yeah, I think um that's what music uh does so well and that's what that's what the gift is with it is that you can when like I don't call myself like an experienced songwriter because I've only just begun but I'm sure that people could look back on so many experiences and if they wanted to sit and write poetry or write diary entries or whatever that that could be turned into songs like it it's all about relating to people and like I say like even with my joke tweets it, it's all about relating to people and people going yeah I, I i feel that because it's nice to it's nice to think like i know a lot of us have sat at home and thought i'm the only one with this problem like i'm the only one that feels this way when you're not like and it's completely okay like and and that's what i've learned a lot about is accepting things and embracing them and embracing like that right now maybe that might not be the right time to do something or right now you have to do this, like you have to end a relationship now because otherwise it's just going to get worse or it's just going to affect you both. And it's it's not the end of the world. It's just the end of this thing. So I, that is definitely personal to me. Like I went through a, a tough time in a relationship and I thought rather than, you know, this getting worse and, and being destructive, it can end up, you know, ending here and moving on and and proving to be in the end positive. Mm. Well, uh, talking about relating to people, I, I absolutely related to the song. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, here is Safe and Sound, sung by Ron. You say you never leave. Tell me how can I 
coming back to you again. Oh, a man without a clue, you're the tide and I'm your waves. But every road comes to an end. And I know, I know It's time to close this case Oh, I see Absolutely wonderful. I adore that song. It will be on my gym playlist. Uh, oh, a slow song for the gym. Well, afterwards. I'm, I'm not going to do it oh. on the treadmill. And that would just be a really sad <laughs> trail. Um, Why have I not reached 5K? Why, Jesus? Another 20 minutes. I know I'll go to the bubbly pool. Um, sorry, letting you into my <laughs> monologue there, listeners. Um, I'm very excited to say we are about to have a show people first. Oh. Very excited about this. So Rob mm-hmm. has very generously uh, given us a signed copy of his EP within Reach. And if you would like to win that signed copy, it is very, very simple. Visit the Show People Twitter account. Uh, and for the next two weeks on that account, you will find a pinned tweet. Now, make sure you're following at Show People UK and retweet that pinned tweet for a chance to win that album. And we will announce the winner on the next episode. Pop to at Show People UK on Twitter. Give us a follow. Retweet this episode and that tweet that is pinned and you could win this wonderful, wonderful EP. Hello, this is Kim Ismay and you're listening to the Show People podcast with Andrew Keats. And I hope you're having a wickedly interesting time. So, Rob, what's next? That horrible, horrible question. You've obviously got the album launch that's that's coming up. Yes, um, yes. What are you yes. What are you hoping to do after? Um, I have a panto lined up this year, which is exciting because I've never done one before, and uh, I'm ready to get my panto head on. It's going to be. Busy, busy, busy. A lot of shows, a lot of hard work. But um, Rob, what are you <laughs> going to be playing? <laughs> playing the old PP, Peter Panto, aren't I? Um, yes, I'm going to be taking the Lost Boys on a journey through Neverland. Um, so that should be fun. But then the next year, I honestly don't know. I'm gonna. I, I would love, love, love to make an album at some point. But acting is my first and foremost passion and that is what i want to do so it's whatever comes my way what's so beautiful about 
your energy, which I, I find myself trying to explain to other actors when they're sad or miserable because they they didn't get that job in Les Mis or whatever, is so much of your happiness seems to come from you actually creating and occupying your mm. creative part of you, whether that yeah. be sat drawing or writing lyrics or sitting at a piano. Definitely, definitely. I just think that otherwise I would... I think you just downward spiral into somewhere where you think you're not good enough and you think that, you know, there's nothing out there. So you've mentioned that you're going to be going to Panto. What theatre is the pantomime going to be at? It's at Harlow Theatre, Harlow so, Playhouse. Oh, lovely theatre. Gorgeous mm. theatre. So I always ask these questions with all of my guests. It's a little bit of a rip-off of the actor's studio, so do right. forgive me. Uh, if you are stranded... Mm-hmm. On tour in Whitley Bay, mm-hmm. or in your case, as now will be Harlow, although mm-hmm. Harlow's not too far. No. What would be your top album that you would take with you? Okay, now, am I restricted to musical theatre or pop or anything? I haven't specified, although I do ask you a little bit later uh, what would be the musical that you'd want to take as well, which can ah, be in any form. So looking so... forward is good. Uh, okay, well, I have to say, mm, this is, gonna, I'm very indecisive. This is something you will learn about me. Um, Joni Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Both Sides Now is, is just fantastic. Uh, that's something that you can play track one and leave. Sometimes you know you want to skip. That you can just leave. Yeah. Um, and But things like Adele has some pretty good albums. I'd say 21 was really good. Like I like 25, but 21. And she's an inspiration, you know. She's just very soulful. In, and, and, uh, and her songwriting in that album in particular, I love. So... Um, Good it'd be, a, it'd be a toss up between them two, I have to say. And what would be the film you take? The film, I've got a soft spot for Jumanji. That's always been one of my favourite films because you know it may not actually no, it could it could jerk a few tears, but um. <laughs> Well, it is now. It is now. He's dead. I know, and he's my favourite. So um, yeah, that's anything. Robin Williams. In case anybody's Sorry, wondering, yeah. what Any, is this? Anything with him in it. But um, but no, that is one of my favourite movies. But Matilda was a favourite movie as well. Those are the two movies that just bring me back to my childhood, which is just um, warms my heart. So I think uh, one of them. And what would be the book? Um, it would probably be Harry Potter. It's just got to be, hasn't it? Uh, Goblet of Fire. I love Goblet of Fire. What house would you belong to? <laughs> I'm in Ravenclaw. You're clearly a Hufflepuff. Well, I like to think people that might think that because I'm, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed, and I'm that Hufflepuff vibe. But I, I think I'm pretty suited to Ravenclaw. I did used to hope for Gryffindor, as everyone does, but I'm happy with Ravenclaw. I've got Ravenclaw pride. You and I would be in the Hufflepuff drama Hufflepuff? department. No, I'm Gryffindor, which makes no sense. Oh, oh, I know. Okay. But then Slytherin. I would be totally yeah. fine with yeah. Slytherin. I Sorry think most producers would be in Slytherin. Do you think? Yeah, the, the the ones that are successful, definitely. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a that's a big statement to make there, Andrew. But you're a proud Ravenclaw. I'm a proud Ravenclaw, yeah. But I am uh, my head shot my <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I am a proud Ravenclaw, yeah, but my um, Patronus is a hedgehog, so of I'm not. Course. I'm not overly uh, proud. No, I am. I am, but I wouldn't say he would win in a fight with a snake or horse. <laughs> but he's, you know, he's got qualities that I actually can relate to. You know, like being full of pricks. Yes, that's the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that one. Didn't yes, you I? did. I bumbled in like a little hedgehog. You bumbled in, indeed. And what would be the uh, oh, I've done that one. <laughs> Sorry, I've come over all queer. And what would be the... We've <laughs> all been there. And what would be the play? Ah, the play. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, parts one and two. I do love those plays, don't get me wrong. Cast me, cast me, <laughs> cast me. Um, no, I I actually really enjoy Little Voice. I once did an essay on it when I was at school. And, um, yeah, I just love it. I, and it's one of the first plays I saw, weirdly enough. But um, I have to say, I bought people places and things recently, and I know that's really like you know, adhering to the hype. And I read that like three times because after seeing that, I thought I was blown away. I thought that was fantastic. It was an extra- extraordinary production, and the play is amazing. Mm. I have no. I do have a soft spot for London Road. I don't know if you can or you can call that a play with music. Well, musical play. I'd say the form is a musical. Yeah, but um, because that's based on Ipswich, which is near where I'm from. So I'm, when I see that and I hear it and I hear those accents, it's very, I, that had a special place for me as well. 
And uh, what would be the what would be the musical? Would that be would that be mm. London Road? Or? No, the musical would be Sunday in the Park with George. Oh, that's my every favorite show. Time. Oh, I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> Finally, somebody says my musical. Yes, it is the greatest musical ever written, in my humble opinion. Yes. Dream I... role for me when in one day. What, George Surratt? Yeah. And what would be the what would be the luxury item? You can take any luxury item with you to Whitley Bay. What would it be? Oh, interesting. See, surely someone said like something to play music on, and you're like, well, you're only allowed once one one album. I mean No, luxury item. That's interesting. What do you class as luxury? Um, I reckon it's got to be, if it's luxury, maybe like photos of some kind, or maybe notebook and pen, because you know, you can really learn some things from writing some things. I was going to say it should be like pen and pencils yeah. or something. Surely, yeah. like face paints, <laughs> face paints, yes, <laughs> face paints. Snazaroo. sponsored by Snazaroo. And then after a year, you would have funded enough to return. Yeah, marvelous. Well, there we go. Now it is getting to my favorite part of the show. Oh, which I'm what the end? No, it's not <laughs> the end yet. It is not the end yet. As um, as we've been quite frivolous in this podcast, the two of us, I think we should be just a tad more frivolous. In that, okay, I have in front of me some utterly pointless questions. Okay, you must answer as many questions mm. within five minutes mm-hmm. as quickly as possible. Mm. Some are quite personal. You're allowed three passes, but only three, so use them wisely. Rob, let's play Funny Five Minutes. Okay. Rob Houchen, your Funny Five Minutes begins now. What is the best gift you've ever given someone? Um, I gave them a waveform of their favourite song. Aww. Aww. If you were a superhero, what would be your superpower? Um, oh, uh, oh, that's an interesting one. Move things with my mind. Move things with my mind. Uh, cats or dogs? Oh, dogs, sorry. Um, if someone narrated your life, whose voice would it be? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Probably a, a, a small animal. Sw- uh, small yeah, let's think, I don't know. Chipmunk, probably, of some Because Ch- oh, chipmunks yeah. are very famous for yeah. their narrating skills. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what's the last lie that you told? Um... Oh, that's very interesting. I don't know. What, what was the last lie I told? Oh, it's always that, sorry for getting back to you so late. <laughs> lie. Yeah, that one, yeah. Um, who was your teenage crush? Um, who was my teenage crush? Oh, my God, that's so... I don't know. Is that a pass? Yeah, pass. Pass. <laughs> that's so violent. <laughs> uh, you, should, you should see the guy in the electric chair. Um, sweet or savoury? Sweet. 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 Um, what is your, what is your guilty pleasure that you listen to at the gym? Oh, uh, oh, there's a lot of young pop there. There's a lot of, like, they've got some Katy Perry going on, but that's not really that guilty. Demi Lovato, that can come on. You know, those things that, even Britney Spears came on the other day, Stronger, and that does make you feel stronger. That is literally the greatest running song you can listen to. There we go. Uh, what would your autobiography be called? Ah, well, I've planned that it might be called A Load of Rubbish. Load of rubbish. Yeah, very Very good. Um, What would your last meal be? Oh, roast dinner every time. Roast dinner. Um, Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Never. They made me say that. Never do. Uh, Do you have a favourite Disney film? If so, what is it? I really like Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? Well, a hundred duck-sized horses with a big old tennis racket. No, not a tennis racket, maybe a, a cricket bat. Or a gun. That's so violent. I mean, I didn't... Me- it would just be you. It can't be... Oh, it you can't, can't have a weapon. Sorry. It's just you and the <laughs> many, such a many horses. imagination that I've yeah, got. Yeah. Um, yeah, can I stand on the horses? Maybe. You take yeah. a while, a hundred of them. Yeah. You're like going to go with a hundred small them. ones. Oh, no, do you know what? Let's just fight that duck. I made the best man win. <laughs> um... If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, cereal. Um, how many boxes, this is especially for you, how many boxes of cereal do you own? Ooh. Do you know what? No, I don't own that many. It's just what I fancy at the time. So at the moment, I've got one and some granola. Um, who is the ugliest person you've ever kissed? Ooh. 
the mirror. <laughs> uh, Minnie um, Mouse Teddy. Uh, <laughs> um, what is the greatest children's show? Oh, get your own back. No, no, actually, that's a lie. Mona the Vampire. No, wait. Oh, I just can't. Is that a pass? No, don't do that to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are the best kind of pants? Um, C3 ones? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like, that sounds gross. <laughs> Um, oh, definitely Calvin Klein briefs. Calvin no, Klein. hang on, boxer briefs. Boxer briefs. Um, if you ordered a pizza, what would your order be? Um, something meaty. Oh, yeah. And how many pairs of shoes do you own? Oh, too many. I couldn't count. 30. 30 pairs of shoes? Yeah, quite a lot. Sorry, I like, I like shoes. Before we go, Rob, just remind us, where can we find out about this fabulous new EP and how can people listen to more of your work if they've enjoyed it? Um, the old EP RH is on iTunes uh, still now and on Spotify. The new EP Within Reach is going to be released on the 29th of October. Uh, it will soon be available for pre-order. I will tweet and let you know when. But you can order hard copies on my website, robhalchin.com, in the store there. Oh, and that noise tells me that is all the time that we have left. But before we go, I must say an enormous thank you to my wonderful special guest. Please make sure to check out his album. Do support him. He's a young artist doing extraordinary work and just buying an album will really help fund future projects. Please, let's hear a studio audience recording for the wonderful Rob Houchen. Thank you so much. And the crowd Adieu. went wild. Um, Rob, how can uh, people follow you on Twitter? What's your address? It's just at Rob Houchen. That's Ro the one good thing about having a very original name. It's never taken. <laughs> um, Rob, thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you um, so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, listeners, this podcast is produced by Arian Productions Limited, dedicated to giving opportunities to theatre makers. If you love the podcast or if you can support the work we do, please visit www.arian-productions.com slash donate and sling us anything you can so we can do more for UK theatre makers, like the rehearsed reading of Blowing Whistles we did at the Criterion Theatre last week. Um, you can help us by giving us an iTunes review as that really helps with the magical Apple algorithm to help us reach more people passionate about performing arts and their craft. Lastly, if you've got any comments, ideas or things you want to send into the show, you can reach me on Twitter at Andrew Keats. You can send an email to info at arian-productions.com or like the Show People page on Facebook at facebook.com slash showpeoplepodcast where you can also join the Show People listeners forum uh, and engage in some lengthy mass debate. Don't forget to enter our special giveaway by visiting at Show People UK, retweet the pinned tweet, and you could win one of Rob's EPs, and it will be signed from all of us at the Show People Podcast. Until next time, thank you for listening, and remember, just be better. Yeah, well, when you have to do a 70-year-old man as a flower, you wish you'd have charged £10. That's all I'm saying.